Hello there. This is Fear My Games with a Warhammer 2 campaign. First video I'm making here, but uh, hopefully it should be a fun one. So, we're going to make a Warhammer 2 campaign. I've been playing the Total War series since elementary school. Rated T for teens? I ignore that entirely. I'm pretty sure most kids do. I know kids today who play Rated M games. Uh, probably not the best choice, but hey, it's up to their parents. So, for the campaign today, I do not like the Eye of Vortex, personally. And I just am not a big fan of it. Um, though it has some pretty cool stuff added to it, I just don't like it as much as a straight-up mortal empire is defeat your enemies, conquer the world. That's the way I like to play. So we're going to play as mortal empires. I've played a lot of different factions here. Skaven is honestly my probably my second favorite race because they are just such a cool cyber tech... Um, cyber tech kind of uh, faction and honestly I've not, not I bought this guy's DLC but I've not played as him yet I really want to play him but I figured that the first campaign I'm going to do for a series of Total War videos is got to be the dwarfs the reason why is because dwarfs are my favorite race I don't know why in anything I always just love how they're just like they're just the world's against them. They're small, strong, stout. They're they're stubborn. I just love that I that about them. I can I can kind of relate to them except for the short aspect of things. Uh, but so th instead of playing like Thorgrim Grudge Bear, the stand the standard guy, I played a campaign as him already. I've actually played a little bit of a campaign even more recently. So two of them. I've also recently played as Unger Iron Fist. I love him. He's super cool. With his unbreakable stuff, I've almost defeated an army with him by himself. Just because he wouldn't break and he was max level and all that stuff. I invested so heavily into him. But we're going to play today's Belgar Iron Hammer. The reason why is I've not actually done a campaign as Clan Ungren. I faced him when I played against uh, Skarsnik. Uh, when I played as his campaign before. But I've never played as Belgar. And I want to play as him just to see how it goes. It's like, from my understanding, it's kind of a harder play style than the normal dwarfs because your upkeep is so much higher. I'm playing with some mods, and I'm planning to, with my mods, um, I plan to, like, put them in the description below in, like, a little Steam collection. Uh, that way, if you guys want to play, play as the, um, play with my, the mods I'm using, feel free. I'm using the population control, uh, mod, for example. To, I'm my first time playing with it, so that'll be kind of interesting. Uh, so kind of add an extra difficulty dynamic to the campaign. And I'm, I'm going to play on hard, hard. The reason why is uh, hard is enough of a challenge I, in the like normal base vanilla game, no mods, that it's at least there's some challenge for a little bit, but then eventually I do admit it gets like very steamrolly. But from my understanding, it's kind of any difficulty level really. Uh, and very so, but I'm also doing mods which are supposed to make the game more difficult. So I'm gonna play hard, hard for now. Uh, if I if it ends up being too easy, I beat this campaign, no problem. Then, then no oh well. Next campaign, I'll move it to very hard, very hard. I'm not a good enough player to play legendary difficulty, but technically, I guess very hard battle is basically legendary difficulty. But you know what I mean. So we're gonna play this Belgar and Hammer. We're going to recapture Karak Eight Peaks. We're going to have a good time. And then the next campaign, we'll kind of see what I want to do. If there's enough people watching, maybe I'll do a little bit of a vote for it. But most likely, I'm just going to pick another faction that I join. Maybe a faction I have yet to play. Because actually, there's a few factions I have yet to play. Vampire Counts being one of them. Tomb Kings being another. Vampire Coast I haven't done a full campaign on. So we'll kind of see how it goes. But let's just get started here with our Dwarfs. Belagar Ironhammer is a king in exile, thrice before he has attempted to retake Karak Eight Peaks, but had been thwarted. His last expedition failing due to the machinations of a particularly cunning night goblin warlord, but now, after decades of preparation, he is ready to try once more. A call to, cl to clan is sent, and the throngs of clan Angron gather at the loyal hold of Karak Izor, ready for battle. So the dwarves are pretty much stand strong, stand fast, kill them with ranged. That's an artillery. That's basically their play style. They're 
their melee infantry, with some exceptions, don't really do a crazy amount of damage. But they're pretty good at just holding line, which usually means they can out they can wear out some stronger at units just because they're so are they're so resilient to damage. So they're high armor and they all have passively magic resistance uh, as dwarfs. Because dwarfs don't actually have access to magic unlike every other faction, which is actually one reason why I think dwarfs are actually one of the easiest factions to learn if you're coming from like the normal Total War games, because of the fact that you don't have to worry as much about magic. Like, you having magic, you have to take that into account still, of course. Uh, but they have rune magic, which are all very simple. Oop, that's a thing. My Lord Celadon, yet hope remains. The dwarf lords of Karak Hydor have conquered your church. Will you take your ancestral home? The count yet lingers. The journey will be long and perilous. There is much ground between here and your throne, and enemies are everywhere. To the north. The treacherous and duplicitous Darkwood, self-proclaimed warlord of Karak Eight Peaks, moves to usurp your birthright once more. Time is of the essence. Yet in the east, the Badlands teem with more greenskins, and even the border princes may wish to exploit your plight. You must not relent. I also want to make sure I suppress the advice settings because I, I don't need them. Uh, I wish I could set it to none. So I'm just try trying to reduce it as much as possible because it just drives me crazy. So as you can kind of see, so how they play. Belagar is the rightful king of king, uh, rightful king of king eight peaks. For a moment there, I thought my brain was tricking me with King of King. I'm like, wait a second. Is that me? No, I was actually there. Because uh, I thought that was going to say, like, Karak Eight Peaks, not King of Eight Peaks. And must regain control of his ancestral home to achieve victory. Until we capture Karak Eight Peaks, we have a plus 50% upkeep on our, all of our units. The leadership is plus 10 when we're laying siege to our units, which means that they're less likely to rout when we're attacking. You can get four clan anger on ancestors, which are those little ghost guys right there. I'm gonna play with my, my mouse now with my finger because that won't really work for you guys. Um, so we have the green, the uh, green one, these green guys right here. These are the ghosts that they also can assist us in battle too as heroes. So that's one of the kind of the advantages of clan anger is the fact that they actually get these four actually pretty powerful heroes right from the start. Uh, we have a rune smith. Uh, Thane, basically the Runesmiths are caster hero. The, the, the Thane will, sorry, the Runesmith, um, you can see here under skills, this is basically like all their information, their abilities, and like equipment and all that stuff. And then under skills is what they can have. As you can kind of see here, these runes are basically his abilities. Not all these runes are actually active. Some of these are actually passive. Uh, for example, Rune of Striking is passive plus seven melee. But, for example, Rune of Wrath and Ruin he is actually a casting ability where he just reduces their speed and charge speed. Really good against cavalry or really fast units that you're up against. Um, Rune of Negation is another one. This one's really nice because it's just a flat plus 22 damage resistance. I don't know if it's magic and normal damage or if it's just all flat damage. But, uh, but either way, it's pretty nice. And this one, for example, is just a passive ability. All allies within 40 meters of this guy get bonus armor-piercing weapon damage, which is really nice. Probably for this kind of character, I probably won't be doing too much into outside of like this tree and of course a couple of things in here. Uh, most of his like his other abilities aren't all that useful, I find. Well, maybe, but probably if I'm getting anything from him, it's probably gonna be specialist because if he can wound targets, then he might be like my snipe character if I have more than one runesmith. But it looks like I have two thanes and a master engineer. Thanes are basically your unit that are going to be like in the in the fight. They're the ones who are going to be taking on the enemy leaders, trying to one v one them, or take on big armies all by themselves. The Runesmiths are basically kind of like weak, a little bit weaker than Thanes in melee fights and all that jazz. But they are, but they provide their own unique buffs. Dwarf Master Engineers are honestly probably one of the weakest dwarf heroes, but they have such night like in terms of like their own power level. But their abilities is super good. For example, if dwarfs, most of, like a large part of your army is going to be ranged units. Triangulation, missile strength for all missile units in this army. 
part of his activatable abilities, I believe he just starts off with, is he can give ammunition back to units. But he's basically going to be buffing our unit on my other units to make them more effective. He can also increase the mobility of my army, which is super useful just getting around places, especially because we're not exactly all that fast. We're dwarves, we're short, stout. We're not very fast moving. So, on top of this little mod that I got, one of the mods is actually each of these buildings here that recruits units actually provides a garrison. The reason why I got this was because I felt like the garrisons are super obnoxious. But also, it's I'm hoping what this will do is this will actually make it so the enemy has more units to defend when I attack them. That way, when I'm just taking a settlement, such as weak garrisons that basically do nothing, I'm hoping that when I get to an enemy force, that the garrison size will actually be pretty strong. If it doesn't work, like for example, if I find like by the end of this campaign, it's, the garrisons are just too small, too easy to beat because the AI just doesn't build the proper uh, buildings. Then what I'm just going to do is I have a different mod gar garrison mod that while it doesn't quite do the same level of customization for your garrison, it does make it so like there's at least the default garrisons a little bit better, even if it's not quite as strong as I would want it to be personally. So. One thing that's kind of nice here about this setup is that it gives me access to Quarrelers when if I level up. And Quarrelers are base, are very nice units. Uh, Thunderers is what I'm going to end up with in my final army, but Quarrelers are also pretty nice themselves. Um, so the question is going to be kind of how I want to um, distribute my... Um, just kind of distribute how I build things. So what kind of what's kind of interesting here about the population mechanic, this part of the mod here... Is that you kind of see this population tab. If you guys are playing vanilla, you won't see this tab. This is just specifically from this mod that's currently in beta. So it says that I have 3, 37,221 dwarfs, but no other, fa no other factions. It means 100% of my citizenry is dwarfs. And that means I kind of get banned. I kind of get some benefits from it. I think it should say somewhere around here. I'm currently, actually my screen's currently blocking one of the growth tabs here. And I might need to change position of my camera for the next stream, but here I'm going to real quickly... I'm going to hide my camera for a moment so I can show you the screen behind behind this. And then I probably won't show it to you again. So if you guys kind of look over here. See, it has the normal growth, tax the province, public order, and all that jazz over here that, I, that I'm currently blocking. But then it has, like, details, for example, that's part of the extension of the population that you can't normally see. And it shows right here that there's some benefits. Because I have, I have enough of a dwarf population, I get this racial bonus... Uh, right there it says income from all buildings is up by 50%. That's the dwarf bonus. I believe humans get something to like, reduce construction speed or something like that. Well, I should say to increase the, the, how fast they can build buildings, if I remember correctly. Um, I haven't played as a human with this mod, so it's, that's just from like a video I watched by Republic of Play. Um, toggling, hovering over this, this thing you just not see. There you go. And there's no dissidence. Basically means 0 to 5%. Basically... If I have a high amount of dissidents, increases the it decreases or increases public order accordingly. Um, and I don't know what this one is. Uh, and I'm there. We go. M meager workers, because I only have about thirty to fifty percent workers, which you can see right here is at forty five percent right now. What that means is that it increases the amount of construction time and as well as the recruitment time it takes by plus one for all units, and also I get reduced income. So if I can increase this to above 50%, then I will get that fulfilled. Uh, another thing they also add in this mod is I can expel a certain population from my city and kind of purge them. Uh, another one, uh, that's expels right here, actually. What does this one do? Oh, this one's exterminate. This to kill any uh, popula foreign populations that I, um, that I dislike. For example, if I take over a green skin place, I'm probably going to use exterminate. Expel is basically if I, like, oh, there's some humans here and I just want to get rid of them or something like that. Or for maybe they're causing problems. And then standard basically just means, it's just kind of standard. My population will swell, it will grow as it grows, and whatever group comes here, comes here. Right, I'm going to turn on my webcam again. There we go. And then over here we have our, research, our technology tree, which we start with Way of the Guilds and Way of the Clans, just to kind of get our start running. What I'm probably going to start going for is not really weapon stuff. When I used to do it, I used to actually go heavily into like military and ignore civilian. But as I've like learned the game more, I've started to appreciate more about the economic and administration side of things. 
So I'm just starting to include related families. The reason, sorry. The reason why is at least I'm not probably not gonna go immediately into the, like anything beyond that, but at least for that it's gonna be nice for the start. Is plus one political order. That means I have to worry less about my cities and provinces revolting against me. It's gonna be super nice, uh, especially if my enemies are act. My immediate starting enemies are actually in the same province as me. One right here, and I think the other one's probably further along somewhere over here yeah, and, and over here. So as I make war on them, it will just further reduce my public order because of the fact that I'm invading and occupying new territories. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So, and I got that researched. Over here is the Great Book of Grudges. As the game goes on, I'll get grudges, or kind of like missions, where if I lose or something happens, then I get a grudge. If I fill a grudge, I get a benefit from it. And over here is kind of one of the dwarven unique mechanics, which is forges. I can create weapons and stuff for my heroes and my generals to make them better. I do not think I can apply this to any, um, to any units. I think it's just my heroes and generals. So I'll be playing around with this one a little bit throughout the campaign to try and make my guys a little bit stronger. Um, but mostly all the good stuff is far, for pretty far down. What I can do here in diplomacy is I can do some trade, try to earn some extra income. But it looks like I can't trade with anybody except the Golden Order, who only is moderately like me. So I'm going to at least get a non-aggression pact with them. Honestly, I probably should have gone non-aggression pact and trade agreement if I'm being smart. I know that's what a lot of higher-end players do. Uh, and that's what I usually do anyways, but I kind of wasn't thinking about it. <laughs> Uh, part of me wants to get the Siege Workshop, so that way I can get a nice side. Like, Grudge Throwers are super nice to have in your army. Um, but part of me also wants money, so I can, like, I afford to have better units. Also, growth is super nice. What's my growth? That's an ouch for me, dude, in terms of that high population stuff. Probably what I might just do is I might demolish this here and rebuild it when I take Zark. Uh, Zill. The reason why is the fact that these guys only go up to tier 3. This only goes up to tier 3 as well. So if I build it there, then that means I can free up a nice slot in this particular settlement. This one is a unique building change specifically for Kirak Izor. In the meantime, though, I'm not going to actually demolish it. I'm actually going to build it up. Because what I want is I actually do want those corollers. This corollar is super nice to have. So I'm actually going to upgrade this. Only to later demolish it, I admit. Seems a little bit strange, but I do want those coreless because they're super strong. I only have four dwarf warriors, so what I'm going to do is... What is that? What does that say? Oh, yeah. Bonus upkeep. How much is their upkeep? I assume that's their, like, the label cost of what I have to spend. And also, I need a money. I, I need a money. What, what kind of war link English is that? I need money to actually have an army so I can attack... Um, let's do that, and then we'll, like, not waste any more money until, um, until we get more units. And you can kind of see here, is as I was recording Dwarf Warriors, my militia population drops. Um, here, I, I try and show it back. Because that's kind of, like, part of the recruitable population that I have. Um, actually, I guess it doesn't drop, it doesn't drop yet. But it will drop once I, like, rec actually recruit them. And because the way it works is that... This is the amount of population that I can use to replenish and recruit new armies. So, and it says I get plus 100, uh, 111 militia per turn. I get about 22 elders per turn, which increases if I have gemstones, slayers, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, engineers, I think it's probably going to be artillery. I do not know. I think elders are probably going to be like long beards, maybe my more elite troops is my guess. And militia, I think Corlys might count as militia. I'm not 100% certain. So let's just enter in there and call that a turn. And we'll pick back up. Looks like one of these settlements over there is just destroyed. We could actually go underneath the ground through the mountain if we wanted to and actually go there if we wanted to try colonizing it. But I think there's a Skaven faction over there. That's probably what that is. It's probably like a Skaven settlement, I think. If I remember correctly from my Skarsnik campaign. So right now our plan is we're going to try to build up an army so we can try and take Karak, uh, b b b I can't pronounce it, 
Buffdar, I think. English. <laughs> All right, but it's, it's still going to take us a few turns though before we get any kind of army going. This one will put us at almost max of our income, but hopefully, uh, with this being built, it'll allow us to get another few um, some quarrelers in this army. That way, it can have a decently ranged army. The range is going to be one of the most important things for us to have in mind. Right now against the orcs, corollars are probably going to be more than enough because thunderers are really good against anti armor, like are really good anti armor units. Sorry, I got something in my eye. Uh, but corollars just have do a lot of nice damage and they have more arc. Thunderers are like horizontal shots, but corollars can actually go up and over, so it's going to be pretty nice against the lo less armored. Um, let's see, I can only afford two more, two corollars, and then I'm out of am, then I'm actually out. So I guess I'll have to make do with what army I got right now, and we'll just push out and kill them. I can actually make a unit of miners. I don't have enough funds, never mind. I was going to say, I can make a unit of miners. Oh, so actually, I just noticed. It actually says on the bottom of the unit card what kind of unit they are. So my quarrelers... Hmm. Yeah, my dwarf warrior militia, as you can see, it's kind of low. And the dwarves, not the dwarves, yeah, the orcs are sending out the, uh, a unit to do some scouting, it looks like. Oh, no, our research just finished, so now we're going to go do Kazad subsidies. We need that income if we're going to make up a decent amount of armor. And we're probably going to immediately to dwarf treasuries afterwards. And we can actually immediately, get, we can set that automatically select it. So one more turn before I can actually make a move against the orcs. Part of me wants to make one more unit of my of miners because I can afford them. I think that's what I'm going to do. It's going to take an extra turn, but I'll have at least have one more unit that can at least be used to brunt the assaults of the of the enemy army. I uh, like a, the bigger the army, the better the army. Okay. And once I finish with that, once I finish with that miner, I'm probably just going to demolish the, um, probably going to demolish that building, recoup my losses, and then try and build something else. Um, I'm not 100% certain what I'm going to build yet. It might be an e economic building, or it might be that uh, catapult uh, building. That way, because artillery is super strong for the dwarfs, because they're both A, they do a lot of damage, but also they kind of figure a place to have, like, just sit there, let the enemy come to you. And you can force the enemy, even if you're attacking, if you have artillery and your enemy doesn't, then the AI will just come to you because they won't just sit there and take a bunch of damage for free. They'll give up their their potentially stronger position to come after you instead. So we're going to use our, what's called the underway ability, and we're going to actually go underground here. We have to be kind of careful. We don't want, if this guy attacks, we do not want the garrison to be supporting him. What we're going to do in the meantime is we're actually now demolish this building. But this provides some decent amount of garrison size, as I said. We're going to rebuild it over here. Um, in Karak Wufdar and not worry and not have it in Karak Izor because it's not really providing enough. It's going to provide the same amount of quality for this entire province built there compared to over there. One thing that's actually interesting to note though, in this mod... Each city actually has their own population mechanic. So when you see me conquer Karak Bufdar, you actually see um, you actually see different population level. Alright, so that's been demolished. That gave us back some money uh, that we can now reinvest in something else. So part of me wants to try and see what I can do right now to earn just some money. Because money is going to be the most important thing right now. So, it looks like I, need, I do need food. My unit, my guys are hungry right now. Um, so, they do need food. So, that's one thing I do need to keep in mind. So, I, if I build the food here, this will give me growth and food, which is both very nice things. Um, so, that might be something I do right now. I think I can kind of, I think food might move around provinces and cities i do not know i haven't as i said i haven't really played this before and only one real way to find out eh so this one gives me plus two food plus five food plus 15 growth both casualty replenishment which is always nice um this one gives us a resource of kegs plus two food and some public order i actually think i'm gonna build this one 
while it's less food for my you for my for my population i'm sure i'm gonna struggle with public order for a little while mm. but also mm. i do want growth actually growth is super important for dwarves because we don't really have a lot of growth in the faction so that's one thing to keep in mind so we're going to make an attack against um selma now it, the AI says we can auto resolve it and we win and we probably will just win but I do not personally want to auto resolve it. I want to play it out. I want to piss some of the mods I have affect the, the custom battles. I want to see how it looks. I want to see if it feels a little bit different. We probably will just steamroll them anyways, but because they don't have a very particularly strong army. But dwarfs are always going to be favored in auto resolve no matter what. Especially because they have a lot of heroes um, just being Clan Angrund. So, but I want to fight this out because this video is not going to be too long. So I want to get a battle in nicely for this video. Get us nice started off with some combat. So you guys can see what's, what's up. So we're going to try and take the hill. And they're probably going to be marked, like stacked over here. So we're going to be stand up here. And we're going to just march, try to march down at an angle. So that way we can at least get a, a, some of the high ground. If not a lot of high ground. So we're going to have our we're gonna do is we're gonna separate the army a little bit more the reason why i'm doing this is actually trying to make it easier for it's called the checkerboard formation it's gonna make it a little bit easier for my archers and stuff to get value if i can separate my units out like this oops i didn't mean to move you um i don't know if i have enough ranged movement to move you guys it's space here so i'm just going to do that and then what we're going to do here is we're going to take our quarrelers which one's better in melee actually um i can click up here to open up their stats and they'll actually appear above which is one reason why i put the camera here is because only thing i'm hiding is a character portrait but you can see all the important information above me up, up, up there uh melee arm armor so this one oops this one is more armor, melee defense. So we're going to put the corollaries on the sides and let the rangers be in the center. Uh, and be more defended in the middle of the army. So what we're going to do is, this will leave a, a gap that will make it easier for our ranged units to fire in, through our front line to the enemy. And when they're engaged, the AI will kind of clump up on the melee units and that might leave their flanks open for my ranged units to keep firing at them. Now what we'll use is we'll use our miners and our thunderers to watch the flanks. Probably use one unit, my one unit of hammers up here. I think I call them thunderers by accident when I say hammerers. And we'll have our miners watch this flank. And then we'll kind of spread around our, um, my lord, my engineer, and this was the engineer, right? No, this is one of the thanes. I actually want our Thanes actually a little bit in front of the army because the Thanes are super powerful. Especially when they're ethereal because that means they take less damage from non-magical sources. And at this point, I'm probably not going to be encountering a lot of magic. Oops. Sorry for that. Something just popped up and been in my alt tab my game out. I apologize for that. It happens sometimes. Um, I don't really know how to turn off, stop it from doing that. So I kind of just have to live with it. And we'll put this guy kind of up here, I guess. So these guys will kind of actually be more of the brunt of the forest. And then follow them as the, as the miners. The, not the miners, the warriors, what am I saying? I would do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lock the group. That way they kind of keep this formation as I move them. And I'm going to right click and hold. That way they um, keep the formation and as I move them. And I can actually get the direction to be as I want it to be. But I'm going to actually move. I'm going to. As these guys are moving out. I'm probably going to adjust a little bit. Looks like these guys are actually trying to rush the high ground more than I am. Because they kind of started up there. Alright. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this unit. I'm going to separate off from the rest. I'm actually going to have it move up to this flank because I'm seeing now that there's even that there's going to be some cav moving out. Alright. I'm actually going to bring my runesmith over here to try and deal with that as well. He doesn't have the anti like movement cavalry ability yet, but he at least has some nice stuff going on. 
I'm gonna move this dwarf warrior unit over here to kind of get a better thing. I want my dwarf warriors to be in guard mode. That way they don't chase. Same with my archers. I wanna make sure they're also in guard mode. Because if they get chased and out of, if they start chasing, get out of position, then that'll be a big problem for me. I'm gonna adjust the the angle of my dwarf warriors so I can see these archers are these uh, archers are starting to come into play. And I want to make sure that they do not. Uh, you guys are archers or just rioters? These guys are just rioters. So I just need to be careful of these guys on principle. So I need the orc boys. I think have shields. I'm not 100% certain. I forget if they like by default have it or not. Thankfully, they're focusing my dwarf warriors and not my uh, focusing on the dwarf warriors, not the miners, because the dwarf warriors have shields. My miners do not have any shields in which to uh, fire back. I'm actually gonna move to have that guy move up. I'm actually going to have him fire. You, oh my, you're being quite the swarm, dude. Okay. So we just won the flank, though, with this with this engagement. So I'm going to now start going around them. These guys are entirely here just to prevent these guys from charging my archers. My archers will... <coughs> sorry. Uh, my archers will win the battle in the end. Uh, but I believe this is just an area around him. How big? Oh, never mind. I'm going to use it right now. Let's get some assistance from this for this guy from these guys. Augment himself. So we just scared we just uh, scared them off a little bit. They did come back. Um, not the end of the world. I'm gonna keep these miners here just as a defense against those flanking guys while my rest of my army is hold defend is uh, fighting them off. My miners I'm gonna use to a little bit to scare off their archers while they're flanking. This also stop them from firing and just be a generally good thing for me i'm having my guys just do some and countering their archers with my own archers essentially is what i'm doing right now i can actually fire at this i don't really need to focus down their leader unless i want to break them breaking them is actually pretty nice because uh, it means less units i need to kill so definitely not a bad idea now that i don't need to wear them on my flanks anymore i'm just going to move this guy around and now these Thanes did a good job. They're just holding the line while the rest of my units just kind of murder them. Fortunately, because the way go like archers work, the goblins are faster than my units are by default, which means that I cannot, uh, I kind of have to focus them out with my own rangers because none of my units will be able to keep up with them. They'll just keep running and running and running. A nice easy battle. I only lost 75 units. They've all been wiped out now. Because I attack the city, once I win the city, all the garrison is wiped out. Uh, when I win. So that's why I that normally, if it was like a field battle, I would actually cheat, try to chase them down, trying to get as much damage down as possible. But because it's only a, um, only a range battle. I mean, not range battle. It's a siege battle. I do not need to worry about doing that. Once I win, I just win and they're all dead anyway. And I didn't take too many losses. Um, most I, most of the damage was taken by my um, heroes and my leader. It's one thing I dislike about Warhammer 2, but I'm making use of just to like be as efficient as possible, especially at this early stage. Later on, I can afford to be a little bit more roleplay-ish, I guess. But um, sending out your individual units, like your heroes, out in front of your units, is actually beneficial because the uh, as Legend of Total War would say. They're more efficient. Um, what am I going to say? What is this? Uh, sorry, like um, from 100 to 0, your heroes are going to be efficient, but all of your units will start to lose. Um, all your units will start to lose efficiency as units die. Legendary Lord, I want Route Marcher because that's bonus moving speed, which means I can move around the map more, take out my enemies more, all around good stuff, Dragon. 
I got some nice skill points to add in. This one's always nice. Strike the runes. Uh, making it so that way um, I can, he can use his abilities more often. I want triangulation. But do I want to get that? Oh, I'll, yeah, I'll get triangulation straight up right now. Makes it so my range units do more damage per shot. And requisition is also going to be super nice to get as well. Though the increased mobility is also one I want to get. So it's kind of like there's a lot of things I want to get. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have this guy in the army. King Loon. I'm going to have to keep this guy in mind. Let me check the other guy. Um, what does he have by default? This is the same thing. I think they're the same thing they start with. So I'm going to have King Loon be part of the army. And I'm going to give him training. And I have to keep this in mind. Because if I move him out of the army, training won't really work as well. But while he's in bed and in the army, he's actually going to start making my units better and better. This guy, I might move out of the army at times. And have him be the one who does assassinations, assault the garrison, assault the units, and stuff like that. So if I have him do that, then I need to upgrade specialist. That way it's cheaper for him to do it, and he's more likely to succeed. Now, I can actually afford another unit now that I've captured this area. But if you look here, I can, so far, you see it's green screens um, are red. And, they, and it says they're actually for extermination. Basically... My population of green screens will go down. As the population goes down, things will start going a bit better. Um, so everything's actually starting to get nourished now with food. It, which is nice. So which means that like uh, my amount of workers should start going up and my distance are going down. Actually, as you see here, workers haven't gone up in my main settlement um, of Karakazor. But the amount of distance has dropped at the very least. So hopefully workers should start going up soon too. As you can kind of see here, um, two turns into this unit is fully replenished. So probably so in about two turns, maybe even less, I'll start moving out to Zarak Zil. So I can take them out, then I can kind of decide what I want to do next. I can decide to push north, and if I push north, I can take out Skarsnik before he can ever become a threat. If I take him out, then I actually have this old kind of mountain range here. The big concern about that one is that it's kind of also the border between the Empire and everyone else, so I might get caught up in some wars and stuff. But we'll kind of we'll kind of figure out what I want to do there. But we definitely our goal is going to be try and push east. Eventually, I don't know the exact location anymore. It's been a while. I think that no, that's too far south. We'll recapture Carry Eight Peaks, and I think it's about around here somewhere. About here, about right here somewhere. We'll capture Carry Eight Peaks. Reclaim it for the king of eight of the eight peaks, but we shall continue that next video This is about four, we're almost 40 minutes in and I do not want these videos to be too long Or else I would probably just stream them and then upload the VODs Alright, hopefully you guys enjoyed this first installment of the clan Angrund uh, Campaign and if you guys want to See the next one, feel free to follow, and I'll try to upload these guys at least once a week. Uh, I don't currently work Tuesday, Thursday mornings. I work every other time, though. Um, so I'll probably, if I'm going to record videos, it's probably going to be Tuesday, Thursday mornings until I start getting scheduled to work on Tuesday, Thursdays, and I'll upload them to my videos that you are seeing here. I hope I have a good day, night, evening, wherever you may be, and I'll see you guys for my next video.